right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church this morning. Let's stand with the blue hymn book, and we'll turn to 298 to start. 298. First verse in shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet. God leads his dear children along. So when the Lord gives you a song in the night or you wake up in the morning and there's just like a song stuck in your head, that's always a blessing. I think of this verse whenever he does that. It's like God gives a song in the night season. I think that's uh, it's in Psalms where it says, he giveth me songs in the night. And this Lord just says, here, sing that for a while. Here, sing that for a while. <laughs> you know, why don't you think about this for a while? And it's usually along the theme of just what's going on with the day. And that's just a blessing. It's one of those little things that he does that just lets you know he's there, even though it's not like a huge answer to prayer or anything like that. It's just like, yep, here, here's a song. Think about that. So let's turn to the next page, 299, day by day. Shouldn't have to turn, actually, we're right there. Let's pray before we get any further. Um, Brother Eric, please, would you play, pray for us, please? Amen. 299. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart Unto each day what he deems best. 
thy strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not this sweet consolation offered me within thy heart. back a few to number 57 we'll have announcements after this and then uh, some special music this morning and then we'll do the message after that number 57 sang this one last Wednesday and you might be wondering why we're singing it so soon afterwards it's just a good song <laughs> so it's good repetition is good we're going to sing it again think about the words while we're singing 57 <laughs> Baptist Church this morning. I got a few announcements. We got, of course, Thanksgiving dinner coming up. Um, the whole church, everyone's invited out to that. Uh, at 1 p.m. we'll eat dinner, so try to be here at 12.30. So if you can be here at 12.30, kind of get set up and we'll do do a few things right before dinner. Um, also got the sign-up sheet for food in there, so if you haven't uh, signed up for something, go ahead and take a look at that and put something down. Um, and then we have uh, games and other fun stuff planned for following dinner, so uh, be a good time there on Thanksgiving. And then um, we have a teen event coming up December 7th. So we're going to do that. That's a Wednesday night. So we're going to do a teaching like we did uh, last month um, over there. And then afterwards, we're going to do a scavenger hunt. So we'll just go a little later than the, uh, the service. So if you're a teen, you are invited to that. And then we have uh, December 9th, we have the Secret Sister Party. So for all the ladies that are taking part in that, and it's open, though, to any women um, for the, the actual party here at the church. So uh, I'm not sure about time for that, but December 9th, that's a Friday. So put that on your schedule. Uh, if you're a man, don't show up, just ladies. 
Um, we also are still doing the uh, prophecy series on Wednesday night. The pastor's going through. I uh, got at least three more Wednesdays to cover that, if not a little bit more. Uh, but that's been really good, so make sure you're making it out for that. And then uh, keep in prayer. Just probably got him on the prayer list, but keep him on the prayer list. Um, Ed Sr. and uh, uh, Brother Ron Conley uh, fighting cancer. And then we want to add Miss uh, Arle Arlene's mother, uh, Joyce Thomason. Uh, she also has cancer as well, just kind of, I guess, returned. So keep them on the prayer list, and you can add the other one. Um, but definitely uh, just need prayer fighting cancer, and uh, obviously very serious. And then we have a special. A specific one picked out. Which one were you playing this morning, Abby? Thirty-four. Hmm. It wasn't that one. No, that's not it. Let's do uh, let's do number ninety-seven. We were gonna do this ninety-seven in the green. I'm sorry. We were gonna do this one this afternoon, but let's just do it now. Seven in the green. Verse 
first one. Ready? Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my strong I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, for his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, songs give place to sighing when hope within me dies I draw the closer to him from care he sets me free his eye is on the sparrow and I know he wants for me his eye sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good to be here today. It's the uh, most wonderful time of the year, in my opinion, is uh, fall time and Thanksgiving time. I do not have a specifically Thanksgiving message this morning, but I would like to say I am very thankful for uh, a number of things in this life. I'm thankful for the Lord putting up with me. That voice comes to mind at the top of the list. Uh, I'm thankful for being saved. That one's at the top of the list. I'm thankful for some good brothers and sisters and some friends in the body of Christ, and uh, I'm thankful for a place to meet this morning. And there have been times in my life where I took that for granted, and I had a congregation of people that loved the Lord, and we uh, had, uh, I don't know, different places in the country that I've lived, and a group of people that were like-minded believers, and then for a little time in our life, we got in a place where there was no like-minded believers, and we wondered if some of the believers were believers and uh, came back to a congregation of people uh, that I had been at a church previously for eight years, and we came back to visit once, and there wasn't anything special that happened in the service, but I was in tears in the service just for what I had taken for granted because of not having it for so long, 
uh, was able to appreciate it. So I want to remember to be thankful for that, and I hope that you are thankful for that. Uh, there may come a time in your life where the Lord calls you to a place or puts you somewhere where you don't have the fellowship that you have here today. And uh, All right, that's my thankfulness. You guys can get yours ready for Thursday. Turn to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. did come across a note in my Bible on thankfulness. It said, uh, when gratitude dies on a young man's heart, that young man is well nigh hopeless. And that stuck with me over the years. No matter what you have going on in life, you can find something to be thankful for. And as long as you can be thankful, there's still hope. Uh, look at Judges chapter 3. Judges 3. And I think we're going to start another series here. Sometimes I sit down to prepare an idea or a sermon and it turns into uh, the two options. One option is just to skim the surface of the whole thing and the other one is to dig in a little bit, set your anchor and just stay there for a bit and we're going to do that in a couple places here in the book of Judges. And I think the sermon uh, series is going to be called Second Rate Servants. Second Rate Servants. And that's what Judges is full of. And that's also what this church is full of. <laughs> I mean, don't think too highly of yourselves. <laughs> Let's just start off on the right foot here. You say, I'm the cream of the crop. You are not Billy Sunday. You are not, you're not even Billy Graham. You're not, <laughs> you're not the Apostle Paul. Uh, Jesus didn't leave you on this earth to finish his ministry by yourself. Uh, you are, and I am, a second-rate servant and the servants have some advantages. Maybe I'll uh, give a different t sort of introduction next week. But I want to jump into this uh, this lesson here, or this this particular man here who does a number of things wrong, and it makes me laugh every time I read it. There's some certainly some funny things in this story. Uh, Second-rate servants, and this is going to be Ehud. But uh, there's some better there's some better titles for this that I didn't come up with, so I didn't claim them for my own. Some preachers call this passage a cloak and dagger story. There's a guy that's going to run around with a sword here and kill somebody in a minute. Uh, other preachers have called this, a Presbyterian preacher called this, how to cut out the fat. And uh, that's not really the theme of my message on weight loss this morning or calorie burning. Uh, but this guy tackled the problem well. Um, uh, evangelist came through our church uh, a number of years ago, and he preached in this passage, and he called the title of his sermon, How Lefty Killed Hefty. You'll find out he's a left-handed man here, and he kills a very fat man. Um, an Alabama preacher preached the fat man in your life. Uh, an Indiana preacher said the Southpaw Savior. And an Illinois preacher somewhere said when Eglin got the point. And uh, I'm going to call this title, though, the uh, beginning of the second rate servants. And starting in verse uh, 12 at the paragraph mark, I read a little bit of this last week. It says in verse 12, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab. We covered that. When you do wrong, the Lord can strengthen your enemies. The king of Moab against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. He did it for a reason. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek. They always come in pairs. They always group up with their buddies. And went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. Anybody remember what that city is from last week? Jericho, good, all right. Verse 14, you guys are ready for the Bible quiz. There are going to be pumpkins and prizes and, like, numbers, and it's very complicated. But it's going to be a little easier than last year. I think the, the, uh, it will be doable <laughs> instead of <laughs> quoting verses in Chronicles that have Thanksgiving items in them. I think it's going to be a little more doable this year. And I made the kids' word search puzzle, so, all right, and that's where I'm, <laughs> that's where I'm at on creativity. All right, verse 15. Uh, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud. Here he is, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. And by him the is, uh, children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. Good idea, send him a present. But Ehud made him a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length. So a cubit, they say, is from the tip of your finger to your elbow. It's about 16 to 18 inches. Um, if you measure Hezekiah's tunnel, Hezekiah's conduit in the Bible, and you compare his tunnel, uh, it's called a conduit in the Bible. Everybody on the Internet calls it a tunnel. The conduit in the Bible, it gives you the length in cubits, 
and you can measure it today. You can go to Israel, you can find that, and you can measure it today, and you can find out the length, and it tells you that a cubit is 18 inches, very, very close to 18 inches. All right, so he made an 18-inch dagger here, almost a sword, I would think, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh, and so he's left-handed, right thigh, that's going to be on the inside, and he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, now notice the progression here. He brings a present, and there's people with him. All right, verse 17, And Eglin was a very fat man, and when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. And it looks like he leaves as well, but look in verse 19. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal. So he left the place and then turned around and came back. So even the people with the present weren't aware of what he was doing. And he said... He comes back to the king's presence here, and he says, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence. And when he said keep silence, everybody got the message. They, they, if you're around a king, you have to be able to take a hint. You know how that works. You ever get around really uh, oh, on top of it people, they don't have time to, to explain everything to you. They just kind of say things, and you're supposed to get it. You're supposed to figure it out. I don't know if you've ever been, like, worked for a business owner millionaire or something they're kind of jerks but you gotta you gotta be on your toes around them and he says keep silence and everybody's like oh that means get out of here let's go so they, so they skedaddle and all that stood by him went out from him verse 20 and ehud came unto him and he was sitting in a summer parlor which he had for himself alone and ehud said i have a message from god unto thee oh, yeah, what's this message and he rose out of his seat and Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly, some message. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. It's pretty graphic stuff in the Bible sometimes, huh? All right, I hope you got a good visual because I'm going to be talking about this for a minute here. Then Ehud went forth through the porch, so he goes out the back door, shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. Now nobody can get into this room easily. When he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked. I don't know if that's the porch doors or the main entrance doors, probably the main ones. They said, Surely he covereth his feet in the summer chamber. So that's taking a nap, probably. He's got a blanket and he's sleeping, possibly. Verse 25 and they tarried, the servants, they kind of hung out till they were ashamed. And behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor, therefore they took a key and opened them. And behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. And guess what happened? He had escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries and escaped to Syriath. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them. Let's just finish. I'm going to preach on these verses here. But 28, And he said unto them, Follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him, and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab, and suffered not a man to pass over. Now, if you make that Jordan River like heaven, you got people here that have been delivered. They get to the Jordan River, and you don't get to cross that Jordan River unless the Lord lets you in. And so he had blocks the way there, and you don't get to cross over that Jordan River and see your Savior, Jesus Christ, if he never becomes your Savior. Verse 29, They slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty, all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years, 80 years from a guy that took out a fat man. That's a pretty good run for uh, some of these judges here. That's one of the better ones. And I want to preach this morning on this second-rate servant. Lord, ask that you please... Bless this morning in the preaching here. Lord, I ask that uh, more importantly than the words that I say or the thoughts in my notes, Lord, that you would speak to people here today. Lord, I ask for a good spirit in here that your Holy Spirit would be able to be free to minister. Lord, that there'd be no unclean spirits here. You'd cast them out, uh, that we'd be able to hear from you, Lord. I ask that your blood would be applied to this place, that we'd be able to be cleansed like you told us in Scripture. Lord, I ask that you help us to be able to hear from you and be able to respond to what you speak to individuals about today. And I uh, ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this man did a couple things right here. But before we get to what he did right, I want to talk about his deficiencies. And everybody has deficiencies. Uh, 
right off the bat, you find out this guy is not the cream of the crop. You find out this guy isn't your first choice. And it might not hit you if you're just reading casually as an American. But do you know that in every tribe and in every culture, there is a stigma associated with somebody who is left-handed or the thought of being left-handed. 10% of the population is left-handed. And the left-handed has always traditionally been associated with a curse or with something evil. And it's been associated with somebody that is outside of the norm. In the Bible, left-handed even has some negative connotations. In the end of this book, the Benjamites that this man is from are left-handed men that can sling stones at a hair's breadth. So if you can string up a string this way, and you can sling a stone that's this size and hit a hair, and hit a hair from a slingshot, those are some well-trained, skilled people. So left-handed doesn't mean you're not skilled. <laughs> it's just historically always had this uh, negative connotation associated with it. Yes, I was hoping you'd be here today. Do you know what ambidextrous means? Ambidextrous. You mean it's, it's both hands, right? But the Latin word doesn't mean both hands. The Latin word is ambi, which is both, and dexter, which is, which is right. So when you go to the eye doctor, they put oculus dexter, that's here, right? And then on your prescription, they put oculus sinister. It's sinister. Of all the things it could be, your left eye, if you're left-eyed or left-handed, it's your sinister side. I was in a third world country, and my, um, my brother-in-law was telling, I, I said, can you just teach me a couple words? And we got to right and left. And he told me right, I forget what it is today. And then I said, what about left? He said, well, just say left. Everybody knows left in English here. And I said, well, why is it in English left? Why don't they have a word for left? He's like, well, it's this. And he said a string of a whole sentence of words. It was probably like five words. And I said, what does that literally mean? He said, it is, the, it is turning to the direction of my stupid hand. That's the only way that they have to say left in, in Chichewa in Africa. Uh, how is that? How is that uh, so multicultural, ingrained in every society that there's some negative con uh, context to left hand? If somebody loses the use of their uh, right hand, maybe their hand is uh, missing or something happens to it, it, and they have to switch to left hand, it's very difficult. But people who use the use of their left hand are much easier able to switch over to right handedness. That's just as much as I can remember about left hand is from memory. If you look it up, there's all kinds of strange connotations and sayings in different cultures. But this man, the Bible tells you he's left-handed. It makes kind of a big deal out of it in the story. Why do you think it tells you all that? To tell you that God can use second-rate people whenever he wants and however he chooses in his timing and to his purpose. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, which we're not going to get into that till the end of the book, but Benjamin is not one of the better tribes. In fact, they get so wiped out and destroyed, there's almost none of them left. And the other tribes get afraid that the tribe is going to die out and not continue. And so the Benjamites set up a party and a dance with all these ladies. And the ladies all come to the dance. And then all the Benjamites jump out of the bushes and take every man a wife. And then they restore their tribe. That's, that's, <laughs> did you know that was in the Bible? That's in, in the book of Judges. Good times. So <laughs> this guy's left-handed. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. And then... Besides that, you would think this guy is pretty skilled and pretty amazing guy because he made his own dagger. Did you see that? It didn't say he took him a dagger. I think it says he, uh, where does it say that? 16th in my notes. Yeah, made him a dagger, which had two edges. That means he gathered the steel and figured out how to put the carbon into it, which is a pretty difficult task in those days. And then he folded it, and then he worked it, and hammered it, and heated it, and folded it until he got himself a length of steel that was really ugly looking and some chunk of a length long. And then he began to grind it. And the grinding in those days was not <laughs> turn on your vacuum and your grinder belt sander thing. <laughs> it was a wheel where you kicked the bottom, and the top turned, and you shaped that, that thing, on, at least on the edge side or however far you want to take it. And he made himself a dagger put a handle on it, put a haft on it, up to the hilt, we would say today. And he put this thing in, uh, in a sheath. And if you've ever uh, worked with tools, you know that you can't put sharp things in your pocket. You can't just go carrying them around. If you have straight edges, you have to have a sheath for them. 
And so that takes some time. He made himself some way to attach it to his leg. That's uncomfortable. Everybody that carries something on their leg complains about it at the end of the day because it's such an awkward, terrible <laughs> place to attach anything. But he had to to stay concealed, right? So he puts that there, and then he shows up in this uh, technical craftsman skilled level, but not swordsmanship skilled. Look at verse 21 again. He had put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. So he took the sword and he just ran it straight through like that. Now, I'm not a swordsman. I don't know everything about knives and swords, but that's like one of the worst ways that you could, that you could swing a sword. Maybe the next worst way or first worst way is when I handed somebody a toy knife this morning and they said, how do you use this? Like this? That's how the inmates use it in the insane asylums. That's how crazy people use a knife. But, <laughs> but really the best way to use a knife is to hold it and take off somebody's head with it, right? If you have an 18-inch dagger, wouldn't the best thing do to be to take out this right here where all the blood flows or this right here where all the blood flows? Or there's blood, lots of blood flowing in your legs. That's a good spot, but not the best spot if you're swinging a sword around. It'd be best to go for the head. Remember Peter took the sword? Where did he go for? Looks like he's trying to chop his head off or split him in two. We don't know. That's the one thing. <laughs> we don't know if he was swinging like this to just chop him in two, like he thought that would be a good idea, and he's a fisherman, so we don't know. And then the guy just dodged and didn't get his ear out of the way. Or more likely, he was trying to chop his head off this way, and the guy ducked because he saw it coming and didn't get his ear out of the way. And Jesus fixed the whole thing up, told Peter to... Put your sword back in your sheath, Peter. It ain't time to fight like that. So what does Ehud do? He skips all that, and he just takes the sword and runs it straight through this fat man. Not the best technique. On top of that, what did he do? The haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. That's bad protocol to lose your knife in somebody. That's just not very skilled. <laughs> Um, if you take a knife and you stab somebody and you hit a bone and it stabs into that bone, you're not getting your knife back. That's what they tell me. I just heard it from a friend. I don't know that from firsthand experience. If you take a knife and you stab it through the skin, hold on, let's see what I got here. Yes. So this is my knife I take, try to take with me every time I go hunting. And this, uh, this would be the haft that it calls it here, or the hilt. And one time I was cutting up a moose and I got tired of pulling on this thing. I was on a river. This moose had fallen. I don't need to know all these details, but it's still fun. This moose had fallen in a river, and there's people trying to pull it out of a river because it walked across the ice, like in Alaska. And so these people, like, tied a rope and tried to pull it out. I don't know what their plan was once it got out because they'll trample you if, they don't, if they're mad. And it was mad. So they, uh, oh, what did they end up doing? They ended up uh, towing it out with a truck or something, and then it got on its feet, and then they let the thing go. And then it just laid down on the side of the bank of the river, and it had got, like, musothermia or something. It was just laying there on the snow bank, and then they had to shoot it. And then they called us to clean it up because that was what our church did, uh, one of our ministries. So we – everybody left me there because we didn't have any knives or whatever, and this one – or I was the first one to get there. And I cut a handle in the side of it thinking, okay, I'm going to grab this handle and be able to pull this hide off. And as I cut through from the outside, this part got – went through the hide – and I couldn't get it out. And I thought, this is what Ehud had a problem with. <laughs> now, I had a hide here, and I cut inside, and I got my knife back. But I was like, that must have been really disappointing to spend all that time making a knife, right, folding it, grinding the steel down, and going through all the trouble to make this, I mean, really labor-intensive thing, and then lose it in this fat guy because he stabbed it in too far because he's super inexperienced, I think. That's just my opinion. But what did he do right? What did he do right? He did quite a few things right. You know, he took that, uh, that dagger there, and number one, the first thing he did right is he concealed carried. That's the first thing he did right. He carried the knife where nobody could see it. Now, I'm just going to make a public service announcement here. If you, if you carry a weapon on you, Something that can be used as, I mean, besides your hands. I know we're all, you're Bruce Lee here. But, I mean, if you have something on you that you carry as a weapon, I have two instructions for you, two requirements, if you will. Uh, one of those is keep it concealed. So fair enough, keep it concealed. And number two, let me know that you have it. That's what I ask. All right? That's, I mean, 
I know it's kind of joking around, but that is serious. And I have one request that you go shooting with me. That's another request. That we go to the range, and I'll, I'll always have a membership at some range somewhere, and that we go shooting together. I would like to do that just because it's fun, and you would probably enjoy it too, and we might both learn something depending on our individual skill levels. But I don't get impressed by people who carry a gun, talk about a gun, let everybody know that they have a gun, have six guns in their trunk. Not really impressive to me. There's just something strange about you if you want everybody to know because you're trying to make up for a lack of manhood in other areas of your life by adding steel to your waist and letting everybody see it. That's not the way to be a man. So with that out of the way, he did one thing right. He conceal carried. <laughs> If you open carry, I know it's your constitutional right in Montana, and that's awesome. And I think everybody should, but the problem is everybody doesn't ride a horse and shoot snakes on their way to work in the morning. So it's not that necessary as it was back in the day. Um, but if you, uh, if you do that, that's, that's your prerogative. But what you're telling everybody is, hey, I'm a target, and I have something valuable here that you can steal from me and that you can use against me. And if you want the videos for that, they're, they're myriad online of people walking up behind somebody in a gas station and taking their concealed carry gun while they're filling up their Slurpee drink in the morning. Well, now you don't feel like a man as much to go buy another one. All right, so he did one thing right. He concealed carried. And if you're going to carry something, you ought to keep it concealed. There's a couple different uh, types of knives that people use for different things. Um, last time I was folding knives. These are all fixed blades here. This is just a regular hunting knife. Same thing, it has a hilt so that when your knife and your hand gets all bloody, you don't slip forward on it. And then this is the gut hook that makes it a little cleaner. Then uh, Brother Paul always borrows this from me when we go hunting because he tries to do this other trick that's really a pain with your two fingers and cutting through the skin. This is just way better and way faster. And then, uh, hmm, what else? This is a good blade to have on you when you're hunting as well. Once you get to the skinning part, just wh wherever you touch, it just skins it, opens it up, and makes work really fast. And you don't want a folding knife. If The best knife that you could have is a fixed knife, a blade that just stays where it is all the time. This isn't a knife that you actually use for anything. This is a knife that you just pull out and look at sometimes. So here you go. I picked that up in Canada one day. But they all have to have a sheath because they're a fixed blade just like this guy. This is the most useless knife I ever made. It looks cool. You can chop firewood with it. You can't break it. You could use it for a hammer. You could use it for anything, but it's too heavy to carry around. And uh, I copied somebody else's. It's not quite a dagger. It's what, seven inches. I copied somebody else's knife, and this was the third or fourth knife I made in the knife making class. And it's balanced wrong. The balance is somewhere here, which is way wrong. That's way up there. Anyways, everything about it is wrong. But it looks cool, doesn't it? It's fun to look at. I don't know any, why anybody would want it. It'll hold an edge, but it's, it's, it's shaped wrong. It's weighted wrong. Everything about it's, I don't even like the way it looks, actually. The color of it's wrong. I thought this would be cool, but I don't like it at all. <laughs> Somebody wants it, talk to me afterwards. Not because you can have it, but if you want it, if you're interested. Uh, a kitchen knife will do. If you're in a kitchen, ladies, and you need a knife, you should know where those are <laughs> and know how to use them. Yep, know how to use them. Not like this, like this. You should learn how to use a knife. Okay. One more. One or two or, two or three more. <laughs> this is my favorite knife that I'll never use. This is a... Uh, I'm not really in survival mode, like during my week, you know, but I like to think about it sometimes, you know, in case <laughs> I ever get shot down over the jungle or something. This is the knife to have. This is a uh, uh, F1 Folk Niven. Doesn't that sound cool? Uh, made out of VG10 steel. This is what they give the pilots, I believe, in Switzerland or Sweden. I think there's a difference between those countries. They give those pilots these <laughs> knives when they're flying. And this knife could be used for anything. I mean, it's sharp when you get it, and you ought to know how to keep it sharp. But this knife could be used to dig a hole to bury your parachute to get started on your journey to who knows where. Uh, this rubber handle is made to be grippy and not be freezing cold when you hold it. But it's not just any rubber. It's made to resist chemicals uh, like fuels or hydraulics in a plane after a crash, and especially bug spray in the jungle. 
Have you ever, ever seen how much DEET will eat into your plastic things? This was specifically designed that it wouldn't do that. The tang goes all the way. Obviously, it's got a lanyard hole, but the tang goes all the way through, so you can use it to hammer on things or to punch, punch things with, and it fits, and it feels right, and it's weighted right, and somebody in the military put millions of dollars of design time into this and sells them for really cheap comparatively, and uh, that's just what a good knife should be. Also not a big fan of this knife, but those are not, that's the kind of knife you can carry anywhere you go. You can always have that on you if you wanted to. Maybe it would be a little inconvenient, but the best blades are fixed blades. Why? Because they always are ready to go. You know what the cops say about a guy with a gun? I'd rather face a guy with a gun than a guy with a knife because knives don't run out of bullets. Now guns have a distance factor, but knives, they just keep on cutting. And if you get in and you don't know the guy has a knife, like this situation here, they can be very deadly. And that's why if you've ever seen a police officer shoot a man with a knife, a knife can be very deadly. And the distance that somebody can close a knife is much faster than you would anticipate. If you want to test it out sometime, you get a guy with a fake gun and a holster, and you get a guy with a fake knife and a holster, and you have the guy with the knife pull his knife first and run at that guy, and you see how far away he has to be before you can get your gun out and on him before he touches you with that knife. And the studies show it's somewhere over more than 21 feet. More than 21 feet away. Isn't that crazy? What you can do with a knife? You know, the Bible compares itself to a knife. You know, this book is called The Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It doesn't sound very intimidating doesn't sound very impressive if you haven't been around it very much. If all you do is use your paring knife to cut up apples, that might not sound like a very important thing. But you know what this man did right? In all the things that he was inexperienced and inefficient at and certainly deficient, this man, number one, he answered the call of God because he was willing. If you're taking notes, he was willing. Look in verse 15. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. You don't know where he came from. You don't know anything about his past. But I do know this. When God spoke to him, he listened. Why did he listen? The only reason that he could have listened is because he was willing to hear God speak. I was in a house today listening to a bunch of women jabbering their mouths off all week. All, not all week. seemed like all week. It was just one day. It was terrible. I had to do some painting. I said I would do like a year and a half ago and finally came around to it. And all day after all that jabbering, I have a friend and she says God talks to her. And does God talk to you like that? Well, not like your crazy friend. No. <laughs> But yeah, the Lord talks to me. The Lord speaks to me through his word. The Lord speaks to me through preaching. The Lord speaks to me in prayer. The Lord speaks to me in circumstances. The Lord talks to me all the time. I don't know if I could write down what it says. I don't think it's worth writing another book and it's getting calling it inspired. It's not like that. But you know, if the Lord wanted to talk to you and wanted to call you and wanted to give you instructions, you would be the first to know. Say, Pastor, what should I do in this circumstance? You should find out what God wants you to know. I met a guy this week in the sauna, and conversations start up in there, and I don't go in there preaching every time I'm at the gym, but what do you do? What do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. Oh, okay. Asked around the room, what do you do? What do you do? Since you're a pastor, I've been wanting to ask somebody this question. I wish that happened every day. I mean, that's the, that's the time. I don't like kicking down doors and making people listen to me. I don't want to get in people's face and, like, scare them with the Bible and cram Scripture down. That's not my personality. It's not my idea of fun. If you're a pastor, I have a question for you. I got this Bible I've been trying to read lately, and it's got these notes at the bottom. What's that called? I said, that's called Study Bible. And now my mind's racing. He's got some new version. He's got some charismatic who knows what, something or other, latest Barnes and Nobles, whatever. Somebody gave him, a, what has he got? I have no, he might have the Book of Mormon for all I know or a Koran. But he said it was a Bible. Let's go with that. 
He says, what should I think about those notes in the bottom? All right, Christian, what do you say? Now, you don't have to have an answer because this wasn't somebody that the Lord brought to you. But just think, what do you say? You're going to hell and you need to get saved right now. The blood of Jesus Christ. Is that how it goes? I hope that you have more wisdom than that. <laughs> not, not everybody does. What should I do with those notes in the Bible, in the bottom of the page? I said, that's a study Bible. And I said, yeah, you should absolutely read those notes. They'll make the Bible more interesting to you. Right? Won't they make it more interesting? Do you ever get stuck reading the notes in your notes Bible? And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to read my Bible today. <laughs> They'll make the Bible more interesting. I said, and remember when you get done reading those notes that you have understood one man's position on what he believes about Scripture. Right? Then what should I do? I said, well, if you want, get some more notes. Find somebody else's interpretation of Scripture. But can we skip ahead a couple steps? Yeah, yeah, what, what do we do then? I said, let's just skip ahead about four steps. At some point, you need to get an answer from God and God to show you what the truth is. You should have told him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is God more powerful than me? Is God able to bring the workings of the universe in that man's life? His name's Cody, if you want to pray for him. Is, it, uh, is the Lord able to work circumstances in his life to bring him to the place where God can speak to him? Yes. You say, he came to church one time, we got to corner him in the back, and we got to preach Jesus to him. Right now, he's got to get saved. Maybe it'd be okay if he found out if we weren't wackos first. Maybe that'd be a good one. Preacher's pulling out knives every, does he do this every week? Who, where are we this morning? Maybe it would be a good idea for you to let them consider something as long as you considered it before you got saved. You didn't get saved the first time you heard the truth. I didn't. I was six years old and didn't hear it. Didn't receive it. Didn't receive it. And I did receive it after a couple of weeks, and I knew better, and the Lord was working on my heart, but it was the Lord that was working on my heart. <laughs> what do you need to do? You need to be willing to listen and answer to the call of God and you need to get to work. Christian, are you working? This man took some work. He took some time to make that dagger. The Bible says study. You know what he had to do to build that sword? He had to study. He had to go to all the other blacksmiths or the one that he knew and ask him how to make it, how to fold it, how much to heat it, what's the color supposed to be. And there's all these rules that have been written down since ancient times, and they're all still in the metal liturgy books of today. It's supposed to look like the color of straw. It's supposed to look like the color of the sun at sunrise. It's supposed to look like the color of the sun at high day. It's supposed to be brighter than the brightness of the sun on a cloudy day. All these different, all these different uh, colors and, and comparisons and all these different things that you would have to know in order to not ruin the steel that you're trying to make something useful out of. He had to study. If I was to study to show yourself approved, if he's not approved, he dies kind of some tall stakes here, high risk, high reward situation. A workman. Did it take some work there to put a present together and get a committee together to agree on the whole thing, to find out who's going to go and where they're going to turn back from the quarries and how th this process is going to happen? A workman. Rightly dividing. He got that part right. <laughs> he rightly divided the fat until the dirt came out. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what you need to do, Christian? You don't have to witness to every fence post that you pass, but you do need to be working. And you need to be willing. And you need to be ready. You need to speak up for the Lord when you get opportunity. And the Lord, you know when it is, and the Lord will show you. And stick your foot out. Stick your neck out sometime and make a fool out of yourself. Just say something in passing out of compassion that's spiritual and scriptural that you can follow up with later if somebody gets curious. There's all kinds of methods you can use if you use some creativity. You know what he didn't do right away? Look in verse 17. He brought the present. Verse 18. When he made an end to offer the present, everybody left. 19. He turned again from the quarries and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. You know what he did? He left and he came back and he waited and he didn't draw the sword right away. Does everybody see that? He 
got to be careful how to say this because I know some people are scared out of their wits to like talk about the Lord. And the reason that people are scared to talk about the Lord is because they haven't had their confidence built up. And the surest way to ruin your confidence is to make you do something that you don't want to do and don't know why you're doing it. So if you've been in a church and it's soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, and we got to get out here and we got to get these people to pray this prayer and say these magic words and get somebody saved and then report back how many numbers we saw this week, it, it does a lot of damage to your mind because you're saying, I believed this for me, but I don't fully understand it. And there's this Savior, but I haven't developed a relationship with this Savior. I don't know him like, uh, like, like somebody that's been saved for years and years and talks to him every day. And I don't like know his character. I don't know his Bible like through and through. I don't understand all these things. You know it would be better than going out soul winning, soul winning, door knocking, door knocking every Saturday, every other Saturday. You know what would be better than that? For you to spend time in the Word getting to know the Lord and spend time on your knees developing a relationship with your Savior. And then what will you do? You'll talk about the things you love. You're always going to do that. Everybody does that. If you love hunting, I know you love hunting. If you love golfing, I know you love golfing. If you love diesel trucks, I happen to know that you love diesel trucks. Why is everybody turning their heads? Don't turn your heads. <laughs> if you love tying ropes together and hanging them out of trees and dropping buckets of rocks on your sisters, we know that because you <laughs> love and talk about what you love. You know, if I could, if I could help you get your love right, th this would be right. Your lips would be right. And it's not me setting up a program or guilt tripping you into an event. You know what this man did? He waited. He waited. He didn't draw the sword in front of everybody. He didn't try to fight the whole mob. You know one secret to soul winning? is instead of trying to talk to somebody in front of his friends, talk to him when he's alone. It's a lot di more difficult to have a conversation with somebody when his friends keep interrupting or when he's intimidated by what his friends think. In verse 20, he uses some wisdom, and obviously he gets him alone. He's talking to a man at a big event, and he was kind of being antagonistic and We'd had a little bit of conversation going back and forth, but people just kept interrupting, interrupting, interrupting. How do you get somebody alone when there's 100 people surrounding you or 200 people know that you're there to preach on a college camp? How do you get somebody alone? Like, Lord, help me give this guy something. How do I get that? And this guy kept interrupting. He said, well, you didn't think about this. And, well, that's not actually what the Bible says. I said, hold on, hold on, bud. You already told me that you got saved when you were in a church when you were a kid. So this is what's going to happen to you. We're going to meet in heaven, and it's going to be a really hilarious situation because you have rejected the Lord, but he already saved you and gave you eternal life, and you have what I have in you, and we're going to meet each other again. He had already told me this earlier in the conversation. I said, so I'm not having a discussion with you right now. You don't have anything to say because you're already saved and have nothing to lose. So, yeah, you denied the Lord or whatever. Can you just be quiet while I talk to this brother over here? Now, that may sound rude and harsh, but this had gone on for minutes and minutes and minutes. And then what did I do? I got the guy back alone. Now, there's a crowd of people, but we got to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk before it was over, and the Lord was working in his heart. What happens when you're soul winning with somebody and you're talking about the things that you love? You don't have to force somebody else to believe it. Just answer their questions. Just give them the truth. Just be sensitive with the Holy Spirit's leading them to do and leading you to say. I don't know what every individual person needs to say, in that same scenario this week, there's somebody else. What about the Antichrist? What about the end times? What about this? Hold on. Just hold on. What's your name, brother? Can I pray for you? You looking for the truth? If you're looking for the truth and the Lord wants to speak to you, you'll be the first to know. Didn't get out my Romans road. Didn't have my wordless bracelet with me. I'm just kind of sitting here in, in the sauna with my towel <laughs> what do you got you got to work with what you got what have I got I got the Holy Spirit of the universe I don't have to work in some guilt trip thinking of what some other pastor's ideal is our church is going to set up some outreach this January 
We're going to announce it. We're going to teach about it. We're going to talk about it and make it available for you to learn. And I'm not going to guilt trip anybody to showing up. We have some outreach planned for sometime in April or May. And we're going to announce it, and I'm going to ask you to be there. And we're going to make it so that anybody can participate. Help us with flyers, stuff in bags, hanging them on doors. We have a group coming over from another church, Lord willing, who would like to help us for a Saturday and just get out as many hundreds and thousands of tracks and information about the church, whatever the Lord leads us to, to do. And I'd like you to do that, and I hope you'd be a part of it. But I would really rather that you just love the Lord and do what you're supposed to do. If you got to work that Saturday, go to work. <laughs> it's so simple. <laughs> some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. I had a brother call me this week. He said, I'm trying to preach in this church and be a help, and the church is struggling. And I had to work a couple Wednesdays. My kid was sick a couple Sundays. I stayed home. And then I went to the guy, and uh, they, need, they need preachers, and I'm offering to preach, and they don't, want, they don't want me to preach. And so he tells me, you weren't in church, and you weren't faithful. The steward of the Lord must be faithful. He said, brother, that's talking about faithful and teaching the mysteries. Did you read the verse before? No, but you're not faithful to church. I said, okay. What do I need to do? You need to be here three times a week. If the doors are open, you need to be here. <laughs> well... What are you going to do? I'll tell you what you should do. You should love the Lord, and you should follow his direction. And when it's time to draw the sword, you should draw the sword, and you should use it. In verse 22, the haft went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. What happened when he thrust that dagger into his belly? He did one thing right. He did everything wrong, but he did one thing right. If that thing is... 18 inches long, plus the handle went in there. He shoves it through all that fat and colon and intestines and liver and spleen or whatever's in the way there and gets all the way through. You know what he probably hit in the back? You have this little stack of bones back here called your spine. If you hit that, you're good. The guy's going down and he's not getting back up. You know what he did? He did one thing right. His technique was wrong. <laughs> Everything about his... I'm not going to go through knife techniques. I was ready to, but we'll... <laughs> Another time. <laughs> Everything was wrong, but he got that spinal column knocked out, and, and that so went down. And he went down quietly. And he lost his sword in the process, but that's okay. You can get another one. You know what happens when it's time to draw the sword? He waited. He used some wisdom, and then he gave the warning when it was time to give the warning. You know what the danger is? The danger is to not say anything at all or to say too much. And right in the middle, somewhere, somewhere in the middle, lies you saying the truth under the power of the Holy Spirit with him under conviction that the words that he needed to hear got through. And this man took the sword and he ran it all the way through and it got through. the message, the message that he brought, got through. The Bible says, The entrance of thy word giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. Do you know what a sword is made to do? I'm told to put on a helmet and a breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Do you know what a sword is supposed to do? It's not primarily a defensive weapon. It's supposed to cut. It's supposed to draw blood. This sword ought to cut. Sometimes cutting is for healing. Some people, all they know how to do is take a dull sword that they never maintain and swing it around like Samson and make a bunch of noise and they never took the time to sharpen it and file it down and hone it and strop it and get that mirror edge on there where they could do surgery and cut out some cancer in some other brother's life and be a help to him. That sword can cut, and it can cut however the Lord needs it to cut if it's prepared and if it's sharpened and it's ready to be used for him. Some of these knives are pathetically unsharp. If you want to see the worst knives in our house, go to Elijah's room. He cuts rocks with them, and they're not <laughs> useful for anything. You can't even dig a hole. They're so dull. And this... Some of these knives are razor sharp, and you can shave with them. You know what your knife ought to be? It ought to be ready to do the job that it's designed to do. This Word of God is very multifaceted, and it can handle any situation that somebody brings up to you if you'll listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit while you wield this sword. Cursed be he, Jeremiah 48. 
that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. And cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. There's two wrong ways to use the sword. Not drawing blood and using it deceitfully. You take this sword of the word of God and you use it to make money and you use it to trick people and you use it to build a big crowd and you use it to oh get a lot of programs going. You've used the sword deceitfully. And woe unto that man just as much as the man who takes this sword and never draws it out of the sheath and never uses it for anything. How are you going to know how to use it? How are you going to know when to use it if you're not practicing and training? In training, some people that train with knives or train with other weapons, they spend time with a empty gun or with a plastic gun or with a dull knife that's purposely made that way, and they practice and they practice and they practice and they practice and they practice, and nobody sees them practice, and they never talk about it. They're just ready. They're just ready so that the one time that they might have to use it, they know how to use it, and they'll be ahead of the game when a bad thing happens. You know what Christians do? I don't know if you realize you're doing this every day. Some of you open this Bible every morning or every evening. And you get a couple words of Scripture in your mind. And that Word of God works on you while you work through it. And you put that book away every day and you don't see the difference that it makes. You don't see the change that it has in your life. But other people see the change it has in your life. Because it gets in there. And it has an effect. And it changes who you are. Doesn't the world say you are what you eat? Don't eat junk food because you'll be junk food. You put this in you every day and this word of God gets through you and gets through you. It will shine on your face. It will come out in your speech. It will show in your love. And people will be helped by this book. Not all drawing blood is to kill. Anybody ever got a splinter and you can't get it out with tweezers and you can't get it out with your leatherman and you can't get it out with your tin snips and you can't get it out and then you finally have to go find a razor blade. And what do you have to do? You have to draw blood to get that splinter out so it doesn't keep getting infected or whatever. It's not always just chopping people's heads off. The Bible says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Boy, that's a cut. I don't want to talk about death. I don't want to think about death. This sword will draw blood. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I've stood in a church service before with two teenagers sitting on the front right row and the girl was a member of the church and her boyfriend was there that day and they said, he's not saved. Would you please just know that he's in the service today if you want to preach on that or if not, it's up to you. I remember he's sitting on the front right side and I, I said, the Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. God has you up in his hand and the only thing holding you up and keeping you alive is what's in God's hand. Now, this is swinging the sword for blood. This is going to chop somebody's head off. Sometimes you need to do that. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of God. You know what God's holding you up from? He's holding you up from the pits of hell that one day you're going to die and take your last breath and you're going to fall into those flames. And the only thing keeping you up is God's hand. And when God's hand is removed, you're done. And I wasn't looking at him or staring at him, but I was addressing him. He got up and ran out the room and told everybody he felt sick. He felt like he was going to throw up. And I looked back on that and thought, was that right? Was that okay? Did I need to say that? Did he need to hear that? Well, he'll never forget it. That wasn't a surgery moment. That was a swinging for blood moment, and he ducked out and took off running. Well, what do you use the sword for? That's what the Lord put it in my hands that day for. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I don't like that verse. I'm saved and I don't like that verse. None righteous? Like, well, I know some pretty good people. None righteous. And finally, a preacher gave me a good answer that helped me understand it a little better. He said, well, aren't some people good sometimes? Yes, they are. Aren't Christians good in Jesus Christ's righteousness? Yes, they are. But none righteous. Do you know anybody who's always righteous all the time? Wouldn't be anybody you've ever met. <laughs> Unless you met the man Jesus Christ. There's none righteous, no, not one. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. That verse has become a comfort to me after not understanding it really that much for years and years. 
Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith in what? Faith in what God said. You know what that sword will do? That sword will cut and cut and cut, and the Lord will use you to wield that sword. He said, I don't like the idea of cutting and all this talk of killing people and hitting their spinal cord and all this graphic fat in the dirt coming out. <laughs> it's good for you. I bet you watched more of it on movies in the last month than I talked about in 15 minutes today. You know what that word of God is supposed to do? That word of God is supposed to cut. And it's supposed to take you to the point where you say, I am not good enough and I need a savior. And Jesus Christ said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Have you ever considered what happens when you pull a fish out of the water? Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Go fish for men. What happens if men are fish and you pull them out of the water? What happens to them? They're dead. They're done. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. That means you're dead. The Bible says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul's not worried about dying. He's already dead. Uh, what was the one I read this morning? It's a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. The Bible says over and over and over that a Christian is dead. How did you get dead? You followed Jesus Christ? Somebody led you to the Lord and you got into the boat. And you're no good for that other world anymore. You say, I want to go look down there with my other friends and swim around again. Wrong world. It's not your life anymore. You're in the boat. You're supposed to be in the boat that's the church that's got Jesus Christ on board. No matter what storms come up, you can get through them with Jesus Christ. And sometimes he says, peace be still. And sometimes he sleeps through the storm and lets you ride it out. But you're in the boat with him and you're going to be fine. You know what you need to do? You need to take that sword and you need to draw blood. You need to take people from death unto life spiritually and from life physically unto death spiritually and get them out of this sinful, wicked world. And number last, get the dirt out. You need to get the dirt out. Thy word is very pure. Therefore, thy servant loveth it. It's one of my favorite verses in Scripture. There's nothing pure in this world. If we go to buy gold and it's 99.999, five nines pure, six nines pure, seven nines pure. It's not pure, is it? You know what this book is here? These words are pure. You ever meet somebody and get your hopes up? And you're like, that's a spiritual person. I'm looking up to them. I really admire them. I heard a message they preached one time where I know they're a faithful member of a church and I know that they pray and love the Lord and they got a good family. And then you hear something about them and you're like, oh, hmm. I set my sights too high again. On what? On man. Jesus didn't do that, for he knew what was in man. You shouldn't do it either. But you're always looking for purity. You're always looking for something clean and valuable, and you have it in this book right here. You know what this book will do? Because of its purity and cleanness, it'll get the dirt out. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. This Bible is compared to water, and I didn't say baptism. This Bible is compared to a cleansing agent that gets the sin out of your life. And coupled with the blood of Jesus Christ, this thing will get the dirt out. Don't you feel dirty sometimes? Living in this world and you're walking around in it and you're trying to stay away and trying to do right and you got some problems and you know it and maybe you admit it and maybe you don't and that's another problem in and of itself. And you come back home with your feet dirty every day. From what? The dust and the filth of this world. Jesus told the disciples, I want you to sit down here, and I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter says, you ain't going to wash my feet, Lord. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. You're too good for that. And many a Christian goes home in the evening and say, like Peter, you're not going to wash my feet, Lord. Mm-mm. I'm too low for you, and you're too high for me. And Jesus says, I've never been too high for you. I'll always stop for a sinner that cries out, whether he's a blind man or whether he's a crippled man or whether he's a filthy man, I'll stoop down and I'll wash his feet. <clears throat> the washing of regeneration that you need and the renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, this world is filled with dirt. It's in our local society. It's just everywhere. We've got dirt and lost souls. People who are covered in sin don't even know how filthy they are. And, this, and the sword of the word of God will get the dirt out. And there's dirt in the lives of saved people. 
what this word of God will do to you, Christian, it'll wash you out too. It'll clean you up, and it'll get the dirt out if you let it cut <laughs> and do its job. And what happens after this man gets the dirt out? Eighty years, the nation of Israel had a good leadership and followed the Lord and didn't turn back to idols. And the land had rest. Eighty years from what? One man that was willing to take a high-risk situation and turn it into an answering to the call of God and do something that glorified him. Would you stand? Would be dismissed? Let's bow our heads. We'll sing a verse of a song in a minute. Christian, are you willing here today to wait? To wait for God's call? Are you willing? So I don't know what God wants me to do. That's perfectly fine if you're willing. If you're not willing, that's not a good thing. You say, I know what God's called me to do. Are you working? Are you working for him? So I don't know what to do. You get busy and the Lord will steer that thing in the right direction. You start working for the Lord and it doesn't matter what you do. You work for him with the right heart and he'll straighten you out on the, on the path real shortly and give you some clarity. You're using wisdom. You're just doing what looks good on the outside, what some other preacher did or what somebody else told you to say. And that's good for a time, but you need to get some wisdom. Are you willing to warn somebody? It's the holidays coming up. It's got all kinds of opportunities. You know who they're going to call on to pray. You know the elephant in the room is you with your religious beliefs. Well, take advantage of it with a smile on your face. You ready to warn somebody? You willing to help some people get washed up, get cleaned up, get yourself cleaned up? If there's somebody here that needs forgiveness of sin, you know that's found? It's found in Jesus Christ. And he will wash you and cleanse you and make you whole and give you eternal life. It doesn't mean you'll be perfect and it doesn't mean everything's better now. But he will clean you up and you got one thing better. You have your eternal destiny fixed. What have you got, Emmy? Let's sing number 333. 333 before we are dismissed. sick and sorrowing on the fifth for the last may i run the race before me strong and brave to face the foe looking only unto jesus as i onward go Dismiss us and we're prayer, please. Amen. All right. Have a good afternoon.